The F-35 Lightning is a remarkable technological feat. A flying computer packed with advanced systems and cutting-edge weapons. Despite its dynamic limitations, it is a lethal air-to-air fighter and strike aircraft. But this isn't the first time that the US has thought to push the technological boundaries in such a profound manner. In the early 1950s, the Air Defense Command began to deploy the F-89 Scorpion, the F-35 of its day, a glamorous movie star of a plane that embodied the technological ambition of the 1950s. It was the first aircraft to automate intercept and fire control, the first to be armed primarily with air-to-air missiles, and it remains the only fighter to launch a live nuclear air-to-air rocket. Despite its celebrity and period and its numerous firsts, the F-89 is now largely forgotten. So in this video I'm going to explain its many remarkable features and capabilities and make the case for greater recognition for the F-89. The Scorpion's story begins in northern Belgium in October 1944. A Northrop P-61 Black Widow is patrolling the gloomy skies high above rain-sodden forests. In back, the radar operator spots a contact moving perpendicular to their track. He tells the pilot over the intercom and they turn to intercept, pushing the throttles of the twin engines to the stops. Although a big fighter, the Black Widow is no slouch. The previous year it had outrun a de Havilland Mosquito in trials. It's also a deadly opponent for any German aircraft. By the end of the war it'll have the highest kill ratio of any Allied fighter. The target holds its course and speed. And it's some speed. As it comes into view a couple of miles ahead, the Black Widow pilot can discern the swept wings and streamlined fuselage against the grey sky. An ME-262. But even as he dives down at full power, it's obvious that the jet fighter is getting away. Almost as fast as it appeared, the Messerschmitt disappears back into the haze. Soon their radar contact fades out, and the Black Widow is alone again. The ME-262 arrived too late and in too few numbers to impact the outcome of the Second World War. The Black Widow's impact was much greater. It owned the European skies in winter of 1944 and the nights of 1945. When the Germans stage a massive counter-offensive in the Ardennes Forest in December 1944, the Black Widow's ability to operate in all weather conditions allowed it to provide essential air support and help to prevent a break of the Allied lines. In early 1945, these experiences caused the War Department to issue specifications for three new fighters, powered by jet propulsion and capable of operating in all weathers. The eventual result of these requirements was the Northrop F-89 Scorpion. When it finally entered service in 1951, the Scorpion was the most advanced fighter aircraft in service anywhere in the world. Further iterations over the course of the 1950s would introduce a succession of ever more sophisticated avionic technologies and ever, ever heavier armament. It was a Buck Rogers aircraft that pushed the cutting edge of 1950s technology. When the F-89 was on the drawing board, the, the Soviet Union's only heavy bomber was the Tu-4 Bull, a very close copy of the B-29 Superfortress. Intercepting and bringing down these was therefore the initial design priority for the Scorpion. It was essential, therefore, that the Scorpion could operate at night and in adverse weather conditions. Nuclear attack wouldn't be confined to sunny days. Naturally, this meant the fitment of an advanced radar. To make pilot workload manageable, this necessitated a two-seat fighter, with the radar observer taking on the tasks of monitoring the radar and, just as importantly, communicating with ground control and navigating. The increased range of the proposed ar rocket armament, designed to operate outside the TU-4's turret range, required a computerised fire control system to provide any chance of a hit from 5,000 feet or more. The advanced autopilot could be connected to this system to put the interceptor in the optimal place for a killing shot. Today all this sounds like table stakes, but this was the late 1940s. The transistor wouldn't be invented at all until 1947, and it wouldn't be in its current form until 1959. The first commercial microprocessor based on that technology wouldn't be available until 1971. The computers that the Air Defence Command wanted, and that for the most part Hughes supplied, were therefore either mechanical, electronics using thermionic valves, or some combination thereof. All of this complexity led to two things of note. Firstly, the F-89 programme was repeatedly delayed, to the extent where the ADC threatened to cancel it on several occasions in the late 1940s and early 1950s. They were also forced to introduce an interim jet interceptor, the F-94C Starfire to replace their exhausted fleet of F-82 twin Mustangs, which had itself been rushed into service to combat the bull. The second point that people tend to miss about the F-89 is that it was huge. The main US fighter of the time was the F-86 Sabre. 
And the Sabre is a minnow by today's standards. It's 37 feet long and it has a 37 feet wing, foot wingspan. Its typical combat weight was about 14,000 pounds, 6,400 kilograms or so in new money. The Scorpion, on, on the other hand, was 53 feet long and had a wingspan of over 57 feet. Its combat weight was over 36,000 pounds, 16,500 kilograms. For reference, it was actually over a metre longer than a Black Widow, which was thought of as a medium bomber and fighter clothing by some at the time it was introduced. I think the thing is that people get confused uh, about the F-89 by videos and articles, because when it's photographed in isolation, it bears a passing resemblance to a P-80 shooting star. It is, however, a shooting star that ate far too many Twinkies, weighing well over twice as much and being about 60% larger in all dimensions. Fortunately for the Scorpion, this size also translated into a heavyweight's punch. A succession of upgrades meant that throughout its career, the F-89 was the hardest-hitting air-to-air fighter in the US infantry. A comparison is again useful, I think. The F-86 Sabre carried six 50 calibre machine guns, each capable of firing 1,200 rounds a minute. In in a one-second firing pass, the maximum weight of shells the Sabre can fire is 5.5 kilograms. It would also have to deliver those rounds from about uh, 1,000 feet, which is where the sight is zeroed. The initial B and C model Scorpions, the A was essentially a series prototype that never saw squadron service, carried six M24 20mm cannons. The installation, as it happens, was actually really smart. It was compact to allow the six guns to be fitted, and it collected all the spent shell casings to reduce weight imbalance and allow for better accuracy. All of this was worthwhile as, although slower firing than a 50 cal, the Scorpion's cannons could put down 11.5 kilos of fire on the target, of which a kilo was explosive, increasing the potential for a crippling hit with each shell strike. Furthermore, the Scorpion could engage up to about 3,000 feet with its cannons, and it also carried 16 folding fin aircraft rockets in underwing pods, further increasing engagement range and damage potential. A small quirk of note was that at this stage, the ADC insisted on the F-89 having a secondary role as a strike aircraft. The B and C models could therefore also deliver up to 6,500 pounds of bombs from hard points under the wings and by replacing the wingtip fuel pods with bombs as well. Can't imagine that the latter was a particularly accurate delivery mechanism, but it was there nonetheless. I believe that this was a hangover requirement from the role the P-61 played as an emergency interdictor during the Battle of the Bulge, but I'd be happy to be corrected if you know better. In any case, the early Scorpions were equipped with a 40 kilowatt ANAPG-33 radar connected to an E-1 fire control system and an A-1CM gun sight. The latter combination is identical to what you find on an F-86 Sabre, and conceptually the F-89 would engage bombers in a similar way, so a similar way in in therefore to the way that US B-17, B-24 and B-29 cruisers experienced attacks by German, Japanese and latterly North Korean fighters. The interceptors would fly a pursuit curve that either set them up for a high side attacks or attacks from the 6 o'clock low. If you're interested in that, there's a link to a previous video I made on the pursuit curve in the show notes. Anyway, a full-scale attack by TU-4s on the US would have been a terrifying melee in which fleets of bombers 50 or 60 strung would be directed at multiple US cities. Soviet long-range aviation had over uh, over 800 of those aircraft by the early 1950s and they would have been very unlikely to hold any back. The TU-4 crews knew that they were making a one-way trip because their aircraft lacked the fuel for a return leg. They were trained to bail out and escape and evade in the nuclear wasteland their weapons had created. The bravery and foolhardiness of those men is hard to comprehend with today's eyes. They also lack fighter escort, leaving the F-89s accompanied by F-94s if it was night and potentially some sabres and shooting stars by day to attack their defensive formations at will. Casualties will be very high on both sides. The TU-4's armament was much harder hitting than the B-29s. It had 23mm cannons in place of 50 calibre machine guns in its turrets. The interceptor pilots would know that any bombers that penetrated their defence meant a city destroyed and millions of lives lost. No quarter would be given. A thousand jet fighters would be directed to their targets by ground controllers using plotting tables and telephones, much like those employed a decade before in the Battle of Britain. There was no computer control for these things in 1951. Even radar coverage was patchy over the US, leaving many holes for bombers to exploit. All of the sophistication the F-89 deployed came at significant cost. The flyaway cost of an F-89B was about $1.08 million at 1951 prices. That's about $12.5 million today. A Sabre, on the other hand, cost a bargain $343,839.
But the F-89's cost and sophistication made it an instant hit with America's industrial titans, who were keen to associate themselves with it, there, with it in their advertising. The plane also became the antagonist in the John Wayne and Janet Lee epic, uh, Jet Pilot. Remarkably, though, although filmed in 1949, that movie wouldn't be released until 1957, at which point the Scorpion star was waning. Even as 40 F-89B and 164 F-89Cs, equipped with more powerful and reliable engines, entered service in 1951 and 1952, ADC planners knew that the interceptor's armament was suboptimal, both in survivability terms and in ability to prevent bombers penetrating the defences. The next version of the Scorpion corrected these deficiencies by finally realising the initial specification for the project way back in 1945. The F-89D replaced the cannon nose with a bulkier radar and an upgraded E-6 fire control system. The radar also received a significant upgrade, going from the 40kW ANAPG-33 to the 250kW ANAPG-40. This allowed for greater range, up to 30 miles, and increased ability to operate in bad weather and through jamming. The wingtip fuel tanks were replaced by a hybrid pod that combined fuel with 52 two and three quarter inch folding fin aircraft rockets for a total of 104. A switch in the cockpit allowed the pilot to select whether to fire his rockets in one, two or three salvos. The E6 fire control computer could automatically control shooting from a chasing position, from perpendicular to the bomber's course or from head on. If the pilot selected to fire everything in one salvo, then all rockets would be launched in under half a second. The rockets burned for 1.7 seconds, accelerating the rocket to about 2,200 miles an hour plus the speed of a Scorpion at launch. To give you a comparison, the, an AIM-9B Sidewinder will be travelling at 1,700 miles per hour plus the speed of the launching aircraft after, after its rocket burned out. If the pilot had selected a lead collision attack from head-on, then the computer would trigger the rockets at 1,000 yards, which meant that the rockets would still be accelerating when they struck the target. Lead collision was a favourable attack profile for two reasons. First, it meant that an interception could take place uh, sooner because the Scorpion could fly straight at the bombers and fire immediately without having to manoeuvre. This was optimal because it reduced the distance that the bomber could penetrate the defences. Second, the bomber's defensive armament was weaker straight ahead because the designers rightly assumed that a pilot, a pilot flying a cannon-armed aircraft wouldn't be able to deliver sufficient weight to fire in the short ter- time they would have to execute a head-on attack. This was not an issue for the Scorpion. Projectile weight on target went up to 575 kilograms per second if all rockets were triggered simultaneously, of which 66 kilograms was explosive. As a contemporary commentator put it, replacing the cannons with rockets on the pursuit curve was akin to exchanging an automatic rifle at long range for a double-barreled shotgun in the face. 682 F-89Ds were produced, making them by far the most numerous variant of the Scorpion. They were also the cheapest. Flyaway cost was $800,000. The Northrop design team wasn't able to kick back and relax, though. In 1954, a new Soviet bomber appeared that took the West by surprise. Powered by four turbojets, the M4 Bison instantly altered the strategic calculus. Air defence is usually said to consist of four parts. Detection, identification, interception and destruction. The ADC was in the process of constructing a network of radar installations to handle detection and a deconfliction system of sorts to handle identification. Although the Scorpion's massive throw weight could handle destruction, the platform was no longer reliable for interception because it lacked a sufficient performance fraction to get into an effective position. It was where the Black Widow had been in 1945. In response, the next version of the Scorpion, designated F-89H, moved away from the trend towards weight of fire to optimise the weapon system for range and accuracy. To do this, the weapon pods and fire control computer changed again. The pods changed to accommodate accommodate three Gar-1 Falcons and 21 folding fin aircraft rockets per side for a total of 6 and 42 respectively. The new E-9 fire control system was the absolute cutting edge of early 1950s avionics. Integration of the radar and the computer provided information enabling the crew to select and track a target and fly an accurate attack course. The computer could manage either semi-active radar homing Falcons or IR Falcons. To employ the former, the computer would provide the pilot with steering information based on range, closure rate and angular bearing. When a ready signal was received from the missile, the E-9 could fire automatically. Similarly, the computer could fire IR missiles when a lock-on signal was received, but this of course was only feasible from behind the target. The IR Falcon was exclusively a tail chase weapon, although the F-89's avionics works to improve the chances of a successful attack using the radar. 
Operationally, the radar observer located, collected, and identified the target and provided the pilot with steering information during the initial phase of the attack. During the final phase, the radar and computer provided the pilot with information enabling him to fly the interception course successfully. Although not as massy as the folding fin aircraft rocket attack, the guided missiles were still very powerful. All six could be fired in half a second, and in total they represented about 230 kilograms of projectiles and 8.7 kilos of explosives. The GAR-1 rocket burned for 1.7 seconds on launch, at which point it would be travelling at 2,000 miles an hour plus the speed of the launching aircraft. Maximum range against a bomb was 13,000 yards or so, just over 7 miles or 11 kilometres in new money. The GAR-1 would ultimately be redesignated AIM-4 and become the poster child for underperforming air-to-air missiles when deployed on the F-4D Phantom in Vietnam. In the air defence role, though, the Falcon's increased range and increased capability of the E-9 fire control system reduced workload on ground controllers as there was less need to precisely place a thousand interceptors on lead collision pursuit curves. Rockets were fired in a similar manner to the F-89D for reference, with the number of rockets per salvo adjusted for the different total now available. Uh, These were now very much the secondary weapon though for for clearing up stragglers mainly. 156 H-model Scorpions were built. These were the last new build aircraft to come off the production line. Extensive testing of the F-89H showed that the combination of the E-9 and Falcon was highly effective against slower moving bombers at medium altitudes, but dynamic limitations of the Scorpion and the missile meant that it struggled to get into an effective firing position against high-speed, high-altitude bombers like the new B-52. Although the E-9 was judged to be a good system in general that reduced pilot workload and was able to track and target effectively, the GAR-1 was assessed to be a problem weapon that needed more work to function as advertised. As was often the case with the Scorpion, more firepower was the solution. In this case, that meant the fitment of pylons for the carriage of two MB-1 Genie rockets, each carrying a 1.5 kiloton nuclear warhead. Each Genie was therefore equivalent in explosive terms to the full warload of 2,000 F-89s impacting simultaneously. It would clear out a sphere of about a kilometre in diameter, potentially containing many bombers. Practically, the Genie had a range of about 6 miles at Mach 3. The intention was for the interceptor to launch it in a zoom climb at full afterburner, lofting it towards the bomber formation based on cues from the new MG-12 fire control system, and then diving away as fast as possible. All this was fine in theory, but as with all weapons, it was necessary to conduct a test. So shortly after 0600 on July 19th, 1957, Captain Eric Hutchinson took off from Indian Springs and began to climb to 18,000 feet. His radar observer, Captain Alfred Barbie, began the air-to-air arming process of a genie, which was, I believe, the only nuclear weapon in the arsenal that could be armed and fired independently without central control. At the pre-selected point, Hutchinson fired. The airframe bucked as the big rocket bounded away. Hutchison racked the F-89 into a tight turn and dove to clear the area. Seconds later, the warhead detonated, a bright flash that quickly contracted into an evil orange fireball, flat on one side. The ball began to darken to a reddish purple as a misty white cloud began to surround it. The cloud rose, grew even larger, and then slowly floated beyond the mountains to the east. On the ground, observers estimated that the fireball was half a mile in diameter and that nothing could possibly have survived within it. 350 J model Scorpions were converted from from older D models, with the last of the conversions being delivered in 1958. This reduced the cost of these powerful aircraft to the same as that of the H model, if you subtract the cost of the Genie's warhead. By 1958 though, the new Convail F-102A Delta Dagger was entering squadron service with the Air Defence Command. The Scorpion was entirely phased out of ADC service in 1960, Jays replaced earlier fighters in numerous Air National Guard squadrons, uh, but the vast majority of these when these now thoroughly obsolete fighters were dispensed with in 1966. Three squadrons soldiered on until 1969, when these two were upgraded to the F-102 and the F-101B Voodoo. So how should history judge the Scorpion? Over a thousand were built, but it's an aircraft that was never properly tested in combat, thankfully. The only time it fired its weapons in anger was during the infamous and ignominious Battle of Palmdale in 1956. To me, the Scorpion was actually the most important and influential aircraft of its era. 
Although the Sabre is rightly celebrated for its role in Korea and its all-round excellence, it was an ultimate evolution of the analogue piston engine era for the jet age. The Scorpion was a bridge between the fighters of World War II and the supersonic jets of the 1960s. It served as the testbed for airborne radars, for fire control computers, autopilots and guided missiles. Most importantly, it was the first aircraft to truly integrate these systems into an automated package. The Scorpion was therefore more influential on US air-to-air tactics and strategies in the 1960s than any of its contemporaries. In less than a decade of service, it introduced three new fire control systems and three completely new weapon systems, two varieties of Falcon and the Genie. The ingenious modifications that American engineers made to it to combat emerging Soviet aircraft and weapons laid the groundwork for the eventual F-106A Ultimate Interceptor. Unfortunately, this obsession with electronics and automation would lead strategic decision makers to overemphasize these characteristics of fighters at the expense of aerodynamic performance and, most significantly, a backup gun armament. A 30-50% to probability of kill against bomber-type targets became a 1% probability against manoeuvring MiG-21s and MiG-17s in Vietnam. Even so, the Scorpion is an important aircraft, and a fascinating one. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I recognise it's been a bit of a deep dive and a bit off the mainstream. If you've got this far, then I thank you very much, and I'm glad you've got something from it. If so, please consider subscribing. It really helps keep me motivated to share my strange aviation obsessions with you. If you have any comments about uh, the F-89 Scorpion, about any of the other aircraft talked about in this, any of the tactics or strategies employed, I'd love to hear them. I get such a lot from reading the comments. Thanks a lot, and I'll see you very soon.